I'm Steve. Actually, this is the one true Steve, and the world he lives in is far deeper and more complex than you might have known. Let's take a technical dive into some of the Minecraft systems that were crucial in making the game the huge success it has become. Voxels and Chunks, the building blocks of Minecraft. At its core, Minecraft is a voxel-based game. Think of voxels as three-dimensional counterparts to pixels, little cubes that make up everything you see. Each block in Minecraft is essentially a voxel aligned on a grid, but managing a world with billions of these cubes would be a massive challenge for even the most powerful of computers. So, whoa, right. This is where chunks come in. A chunk is a 16 by 16 area, which extends from the bedrock right up to the sky limit. A chunk can be up to 384 blocks tall. Combine that with the 16 by 16 area of a chunk, and that's just over 98,000 block spaces. Chunks are the game's way of dividing the map into manageable pieces so that the engine isn't overloaded with infinite terrain. When you play the game, it only loads chunks around the player and stores those in memory. Far off chunks that you can't see are stored on the disc and stay unloaded until you approach them. It's impossible to keep the whole world in memory. That would be 235 petabytes if the world was fully generated at all times. A train of that size would be several times the surface of planet Earth. The solution was to split the world into 16 by 16 by 128 chunks back in the alpha and have them only generate or load when needed. This is why when you explore, you may see terrain popping up. This is the game generating new chunks on the fly within your draw distance. Chunks outside your view or set radius get saved to the disc in a special compressed format and are simply reloaded if a player returns. Back in the Java Edition Alpha, this was stored in a level.dat format, which is a tree type structure. This would store information such as player location, player health, time of day, and most importantly, the chunk files. Information such as the X and Z coordinates of the chunks, whether the chunks should contain trees, flowers, ores, and so on. The Java Edition now uses an updated storing system called the Amphi file format, which brings improvements over the earlier format. In some instances, there have been cases where an entire chunk has failed to load, as you're running around, you may encounter a 16 by 16 hole in the train. Best not to drop down there. Next, let's take a look at seeds and how it uses noise and math to create and recreate its sprawling landscapes. A world seed is basically the ID of your world's terrain. It's a number that Minecraft uses to start the world generation. If you feed the game the same feed, it will output the same world every time. And that's why if you share your seed with a friend, you'll both have the exact same biomes, or locations, tree placements, and everything else providing you're on the same version. However, this randomness isn't truly random. It's actually calculated by an algorithm known as Perlin noise. This is a mathematical function used in games that helps to produce organic wavy looking patterns perfect for mountains and valleys. When generating a chunk, Minecraft may sample several noise maps. For instance, one for elevation, another for roughness such as hills or plains, and another for biome variations and etc. These noise functions take the seed as part of their input, which result in a chaotic but totally believable and natural looking world. To break this down, imagine the game needs to know the height of the train at position XYZ. It runs a noise function to get a value, let's say 65 blocks high, and it does this across the whole chunk, and you'd end up with something like some rolling hills. Minecraft combines multiple octaves of purling noise, a smooth low frequency noise for broad terrain like plains and mountains, and higher frequencies for bumps and details. If a high threshold is passed, it might decide this area is mountainous and use a high noise to create jagged peaks. All these calculations use the seed as a base, ensuring they always output the same value each time for a constant starting point. Mob spawning mechanics, how and why mobs appear. Ever notice that monsters only spawn in the dark or that certain animals seem to spawn in certain areas? How does Minecraft decide when to pop a creeper behind you or spawn a herd of cows in a field? Let's shed some light, pun intended, on the rules of mob spawning in Minecraft. The game uses a set of rules and algorithms to spawn mobs, both hostile and passive. There are certain conditions that must be met to spawn a particular mob. For example, light level, the biome, player proximity, and a cap on how many mobs can exist at one time. These all factor into what particular mob will spawn. Let's take light levels for example. For hostile mobs, darkness is key. In modern versions of Minecraft, the monsters require a block light level of zero to spawn. This is why it's useful to spam torches everywhere. A single light level above zero can prevent a zombie, spider, skeleton, or worse. On the flip side, passive mobs like animals require a higher light value. Animals such as cows, pigs, and sheep spawn on grass blocks in well-lit areas, and their counterparts will burn up when exposed to light in the morning. This is why you don't see enemies in the day. Different biomes also spawn unique mob populations. 
Obviously, you won't see a polar bear in the jungle or desert, but in a snowy biome, there's a higher probability of one spawning. The same logic can apply to enemies. For instance, zombies and skeletons can spawn virtually anywhere at night, but husks, which is a variant of a zombie, will only spawn in the desert. Just as strays, the snowy zombies, will only spawn in snowy areas. Some mobs even have structural requirements. For example, a witch will reliably spawn inside of a witch hut when it is generated or created, alongside her black cat of course. To determine which mobs should spawn in which biomes, the game can check the chunks to find out which biome group they belong to and spawn mobs accordingly. Now, it should go without saying that mobs won't spawn in unloaded chunks. The game considers the area near the players for spawning. In the Java edition, mobs can spawn between 24 to 128 blocks away from the player. This prevents mobs from just suddenly appearing right in front of you. This is why at night time, monsters gradually accumulate at a comfortable distance before approaching you. Animals spawn a little bit differently though. They spawn when a new chunk is loaded. This is why animals can be a limited resource. They don't constantly respawn the way hostiles do. Obviously, this doesn't include animals spawned via breeding. To prevent the world from overloading with mobs, Minecraft sets mob caps. This limits how many mobs of a certain category can exist in loaded chunks. Typically, there is a cap of 70 hostile monsters in the Java edition. There is also a cap for 10 passive creatures like animals and a cap of 20 for fish. These mob caps scale with the number of chunks loaded and the number of players playing. engine evolution from Java to Bedrock. Now, it's hard to cover all the changes from the Java edition to the Bedrock edition. Systems have changed over various iterations, such as the way voxels and chunks are stored, and it continues to change and improve to this day. But it's incredible to think that one of the world's best-selling games began as a humble Java application. Java is best known for creating software and web applications. So why Java? The most likely reason was because Notch was already comfortable with Java and Java's portability which allowed the game to run on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Early Minecraft didn't need to be super optimized. It was a sandbox game with simple graphics, and Java let Notch iterate quite quickly. However, as Minecraft grew, there were limitations. Java didn't play well when trying to create Minecraft for mobile. Instead, the team had to create a C++ version for mobile. Over time, they expanded this C++ codebase to other platforms such as console, tablet, and mobile. Java simply couldn't run on some of these platforms and was hard to optimize for some hardware. The C++ version is known as the Bedrock Edition, and this allowed Minecraft to hit 60 frames per second on phones and have improved loading times, things the Java Edition would have struggled with on some of the weaker hardware. So, is the Java Edition dead? No, we have two parallel engines. The Java Edition, which is still maintained for PC players and the modding community, and the Bedrock Edition in C++ for everything else. The Bedrock Edition is virtually identical to the Java Edition, but it wasn't just a copy and paste between the code bases, it's a complete re-implementation. You might ask, why not convert the Java Edition into C++ entirely? Well, the answer is partially legacy and community. The Java Edition has a huge modding scene and runs on any desktop with Java. Microsoft's approach has been to keep the Java Edition around for the PC community, while pushing the C++ Bedrock Edition for crossplay and future development. Loot tables, the secret behind what you get. You've just killed a zombie and the loot it drops is completely random, right? Well, no, not quite. It's guarded by something called a loot table. These are essentially config files that control all drops and loot generation. Loot tables are basically JSON files that Jason! 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 define what items can drop from a source, like a mob, chest, fishing, and etc and the probability of that drop. Think of a loot table as a roulette wheel, with sections for each possible item. Each section can have a different percentage, determining how likely it is to be picked. When you kill a mob or open a chest, the game refers to the appropriate loot table and essentially rolls a dice to generate the item. Each item within a loot table is often assigned a weight. This determines the likelihood of the item being selected when the loot table is triggered. Items with higher weights have a greater chance of appearing, while rarer items have a lower weight. A loot table can have one or more pools. Each pool is like one independent roll. For example, a chest might have two pools. One pool guarantees one to three common items like sticks and stones, and another pool for rare items. The final loot generated is the combination of both pools. Loot tables can also include conditions that must be true for an entry to drop. These are like if statements. For example, a common condition would be if killed by a player, then drop loot. Enemies not killed by a player would not trigger this true statement, and no loot would likely be dropped in that scenario. This is just one case scenario. Other scenarios can include requirements where a skeleton only drops a disc if the final blow is from an arrow. This allows the developers to fine tune their loot tables, so there's so many different scenarios. In some loot tables like fishing or chest loot, there is a concept of luck. In the Java edition, you can increase your luck with a luck potion. With the status active, it can influence the quality of the loot you receive from the loot table.
With these systems, we can really appreciate how deep and intricate Minecraft really is. On the surface, it looks like a pretty simple game, partially due to its simplistic look, but under the hood, it's one of the most complex and beta-driven games you'll probably play. As we know, Minecraft is more than just a game. With the recent release of the film, we're excited to see what is next for Minecraft and what indie game do you think is going to be the next big hit. Let us know in the comments and we hope you found this video about Minecraft useful. And if you want to find out why some games feel boring and other games feel great, check out this next video. Till next time, stay awesome.